Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I am the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm honored to introduce today's program, From Iran to America, The Strength and Struggles of Persian Jewish Women. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank the American Jewish Committee Los Angeles for co-presenting today's program. Joining us today are Esther Amini and Roya Hakakian, who will be in conversation with Saba Sumek. Esther Amini is a writer, painter, and psychoanalytic psychotherapist in private practice. Esther is a first-generation American, and her parents fled Mashhad, Iran, in the 1950s, where they had been forced to become crypto-Jews. Her book, Concealed, tells the story of being caught between the traditional world of her parents and the freewheeling one of 1960s New York. Concealed has been named one of the best books of 2020 by Kirkus Reviews. Roya Hakakian is an author and Persian poet who has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. She grew up in Tehran and immigrated to the United States following the Iranian Revolution. Her book, a Journey from the Land of No, A Girlhood Caught in Revolutionary Iran, was a Barnes and Noble's Pick of the Week, Ms. Magazine Must Read of the Summer, Publisher Weekly's Best Book of the Year, Elle Magazine's Best Nonfiction Book of 2004, was named Best Memoir by the Connecticut Center for the Book in 2005, and has been translated into several languages, including German, Dutch, and Spanish. Dr. Saba Sumek is the Associate Director of the American Jewish Committee Los Angeles and a lecturer at the Academy for Jewish Religion California, where she teaches religious studies and Middle Eastern history courses. She is the author of From the Shahs to Los Angeles, Three Generations of Iranian Jewish Women Between Religion and Culture, which was awarded the gold medal in, 20, in the 2013 Independent Publisher Book Award in the Religion category. Um, I'll put the links of where you can buy each of these books into the chat momentarily. Um, but during this, the discussion, please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can during the hour. This program is being recorded, and the video will be available tomorrow on the museum's YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for being here, and I'm now going to hand things over to Saba. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, thank you all for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you. Esther and Roya, if I could kindly ask you both to um, put your screens back on and we could start our questions. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for being here. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be in conversation with both of you. And I know Sydney did a great job giving us an introduction, but if I can, can I kindly ask Esther um, and Roya. Esther, why don't we have you go first? Can you please give me a bio, a background of your life? Obviously a brief background. Sure. <clears throat> uh, my parents came from the Iranian city of Mashhad. Uh, they left Iran after World War II. This was, they arrived here in 1947 in New York. But to get back to Mashhad, Mashhad is the most fanatically religious city in all of Iran. It's considered the holiest city. The ninth century Imam Reza is buried there. So millions of people from around the world come to pay homage to Imam Reza, which makes that soil holy. Um, in this city, which is a Shiite stronghold, a pilgrimage site with a long history of maiming and massacring infidels, you have a tight Jewish community living in the city of Mashhad as crypto Jews. They were hidden. They were hiding their true identity above ground. They were behaving as if they were Muslim. My mother wore the black chadar, the burqa from head to toe covered, looking through eye slits. My father prayed from the Quran many times a day alongside other Muslims. And yet in the secrecy and privacy of their home, they were devout Jews. My ancestors lived this way. My parents lived this way. It went right into the middle of the 20th century. Fast forward, they came to the United States after World War II. And a few years later, I was born in New York. So the memoir called Concealed is really about how they concealed themselves and how that trickled down to me. And even though I was growing up in the United States, I was concealing myself. Thank you, Esther. We have so much to um, really unpack with all of that. Uh, Roya, can you please tell me about your life? 
Um, mine isn't half as interesting as Esther's. I think um, it is. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but it's, it's really fascinating because uh, as Esther spoke, I remembered that um, one of the uh, greatest moments of my childhood in Iran, um, in Tehran, where I was born and raised, was when my father's Mashadi friends, who had a big thriving business in Tehran, used to invite us over for Passover. And because we didn't have a lot of kosher for Passover foods in Iran, there were no cookies, nothing sweet to eat all through Passover, except at their home, at the home of the Mashadi Jews who were close to my dad. So it was one of the only homes I made sure to visit with my parents during, during Pesach. And, uh, and they had lots of macaroons and things that I hadn't seen until I came to the United States. So I have very, very fond memories of, of, this, of the little contact that we had uh, with them and, and what I understood about the story of the Mashadi Jews. So it will be a pleasure to hear more from you, uh, Esther. Um, so, uh, as I said, I was born and raised in, in Tehran, and my father, along with, um, you know, some other uh, members of our extended family, made up um, it, the, the Jewish educators uh, within the Jewish community uh, in Tehran. My uncle was a Hebrew teacher at, uh, at one school. My father was the principal at another Hebrew day school. So. Um, we, um, you know, we, we lived in a middle class neighborhood in Tehran, but, but, you know, um, we were very overtly practicing Jews and, uh, and the synagogue and the Jewish community was a great part of our lives. Um, and then all of that, as everyone knows, uh, changed in 1979. Um, and my mother and I left several years later after the revolution. Um, which seems to be very uh, a point that a lot of people who have uh, written about my book seem to miss, uh, especially if they've been Jews. They, um, they all assume that all of us Iranian Jews left in 1978 and 1979. So, you know, um, some people have cast doubt over the fact that um, I speak about the time of the revolution and post-revolutionary Iran. Um, and they say, oh, she couldn't have seen it. Well, <laughs> all of us didn't leave uh, in the same year. And uh, my mother and I left. Leave? Um, uh, my mother and I left in August of 1984. So we were there for about five years after. And my father stayed even longer uh, and was reunited with us in 1989. And, and you were there at the height of the Iran-Iraq war. So you experienced all of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mention this only because um, there have been um, some, you know, uh, research papers and you know, book reviews done specifically, actually, by um, fellow Iranian Jews, where you know uh, they keep mentioning that how could Roya have known uh, what was happening uh, in Iran at the time of the Iranian Revolution or thereafter. Um, because everyone assumes that, you know, the community made a massive move on sound, you know, um, right, exactly. on mass, and that wasn't the case. And very, a lot of Iranian Jews stayed, and um, uh, was it, how did you get out? Was it through Hayas coming via Austria? Well, Hayas gets in, Hayas always gets involved once you are uh, out of mm -hmm. Iran. So uh, the big challenge was, you know, how do you get, out of Iran, and in those early years, it was um, it was incredibly difficult. In some ways, um, it was much harder to be Jewish in in the early years after the revolution than it is to be Jewish in Iran now. Wow. And and it's an irony because people keep you know being surprised by by my assertion. But the fact is that as the Jewish community dwindled in numbers, and as it seemed less and less of a threat, it has been allowed to do more. Um, because, you know, um, it, it just isn't what it used to be. It doesn't present a threat. It doesn't, uh, and it's very clear that it's a dying community. So they, they are being given 
far more uh, rights to practice and to have schools and synagogues and stuff um, as compared to the time that, that we um, were trying to leave. And it was, a, it was a difficult time in that I think, uh, not that I think, but that, that Jews were not uh, exactly barred from leaving Iran, but they were not uh, overtly and officially uh, or easily granted permission to leave either. So right. when my mother and I applied, we uh, our passports were held up or you know confiscated at the, at the you know passport office until you know a whole lot of other things that we had to do in order to get our passports. Right, and I think it's interesting that you said it's a dying community. Um, because in many ways it is from 100,000 plus Jews to uh, what, 10, 12,000. But ironically, it's also one of the largest Jewish communities still in the Middle East outside of Israel, comparing to the fact that most Jews either left or were, you know, forced to leave um, due to dire conditions in other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. So, um, Esther, let's go back to you. Your family is really interesting because with like Roya's family, my family, a lot of us left either right before the revolution or right, you know, after the revolution, but your family came a lot earlier. Why did they choose to come to America? And, you know, and why, what was that like for you growing up as a Iranian Jew in New York when there weren't Iranian Jews all over New York or Great Neck or Los Angeles, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think I have to backtrack a bit because I was listening to Roya and what I and I didn't want to interrupt, but but I think I have to insert that so much depends on where what, what city you came from. You know, if I if a comparison could be if one came from Appalachia versus San Francisco, it's as if you came from a different country. Um, the same coming from the city of Mashhad versus Tehran, diametrically opposite, diametrically opposite. So even though we are both of Iranian Jewish background, uh, our stories are very, very different, which is what makes it interesting. Um, in the case of my parents, they were living as crypto Jews while at the same time in the mid 20th century, uh, Jews in Tehran were not uh, necessarily. In, in Mashhad, girls were not allowed to step foot into a classroom. They were kept illiterate. My mother was illiterate. All the women in my family, grandmother, great grandmother, were illiterate. I'm the first one that actually became educated and learned to read and write. Uh, in Tehran, girls were sent to school. This, this was the norm. Uh, in Mashhad, uh, girls were married off at the age of eight to men 20 years older than them. And this was in the middle of the 20th century. We're not talking a long time ago. Uh, my grandmother was nine. This is my father's mother. Uh, she was nine when she was forced to marry my grandfather who was then 29. So again, just imagine a, a nine-year-old girl next to a 29-year-old man. My mother was 14 when she was forced to marry my father, who was 34. This was the norm in Mashhad within the Muslim world. And then the Jews did this as well, partly to conceal who they were, partly so that they wouldn't intermarry if a Muslim knocked on their door and asked for their daughter's hand, they'd say she's spoken for. And you can say that about an eight-year-old. So there were many reasons for this, but this was you know, the cobweb. And then I know at the same time, mid 20th century in Tehran, girls were aff within affluent families, girls were being sent to Swiss boarding schools. So we're talking about diametric opposites. Um, and you ask why they came. Uh, my mother was, was the engine. And even though she was illiterate and 20 years younger than my father, uh, she outmuscled him. And he was a strong, strong traditional character. Um, there was tremendous anti-Semitism in Mashhad. 
Uh, it was a terrifying place to live in spite of the fact that they pretended they were Muslim, in spite of the fact that they were crypto Jews, because it was, there was a masquerade. I mean, even though all this was going on, the Muslims knew who the Jews were. They lived in a ghetto called Eidga. And every once in a while, they'd pilfer, pillage, rape, murder the Jews. Uh, and that's a whole story of its own. And so my mother had finally decided when my two brothers were very young, I have two brothers that were born in Iran, uh, that she couldn't tolerate it anymore. And that she was going to yank the family out and come. And they left in 1946. It took them a whole year to arrive in New York. Back then, 1946, right after World War II, you could not jump on a TWA plane and leave Tehran for New York. So it was by horse and buggy, it was by foot, it was all kinds of ways where they got themselves into Afghanistan. Then from there they went to India and then they were stuck in India for over 13 months. And finally got onto an American troop ship that brought them to California. And from there, they went cross country to New York. It was a, a, an odyssey. Uh, and I write about it in, in Concealed, and there's a lot of humor as well. You know, lots of crazy moments, culture clashes, misunderstandings of one another, the two worlds, the Western world, the Far Eastern world. Um, but it was my mother who spearheaded this exodus. Um, and to her credit, and, and um, I was born in the States, and so my life apparently would be different, but wasn't so much because they really brought Mashad into the living room. So, so Esther, well, definitely, I wanna talk about that, especially as a woman growing up um, in that community. Roya, what was it like for your family to come to America? What was it like for you to come to America in 84? And I think you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> I arrived in 85. Um, like Esther's family, it took us a while to get here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because it, it was just that by the time um, we signed on to HIAS um, and then, you know, uh, we had to eventually end up in Vienna, which, is, which was the way station where Iranian Jews um, had to go to in order to be processed for asylum. Um, it, at that time, the wait time to get to America was about nine months, and we had already spent a month or two um, to get to Vienna. So, so it, it took about a year uh, to get here, and, and I, you know, in, in one simple word, was miserable. I, I didn't want to be here. I had spent a year in Austria. I had started uh, learning German. I, um, I did a little bit of English, uh, if I had any, had uh, escaped my mind. I, um, I just, I had come from the revolutionary Iran. My head was full of, you know, anti-American chants. My heart was full of sorrow. I was missing everyone. And, uh, and you know the community of friends, uh, namely you know Jewish uh, younger Jewish uh, students who uh, with whom we had an organization which I talk about in my memoir, um, were a huge part of my life. So I was missing them. Um, you know I think that's a that's a general uh, story of uh, you know bereft immigrant um, trying to. Uh, you know, piece together a new life. And, and so that's what happened. And uh, it, a lot of it um, took longer than, than it could have, I think. Um, but, I, you know, had, had I, um, you know, found a, a, an easier time or a, a community to slip into, but it took a while. And, and so um, some things were prolonged, but here we are. So this question is for both of you, and Esther, we'll start, we'll go back to you. Um, what, Iranian Jewish communities tend to be very traditional. 
things are changing now, but they tend to be very traditional, especially during the time of grandmother, mother, daughter generations, and this concept of Najib and women having to be sexually pure and watching out for their reputation and everything about American society, American pluralistic society, which by nature, uh, at least on paper, is supposed to be egalitarian with boundaries and you go away to college and this and that is very different than what you are brought up in an Iranian Jewish home. So Esther, what was that like for you? And then of course, Roy, I'd love for you to answer that question. Was, was that the way you were raised? I should even ask. Well, I was raised. I was raised with, <clears throat> by, I was raised by the city of Mashhad. <laughs> Uh, their values, their principles, the whole notion of abru, one's face, one's image, one's reputation um, is very, very important. Uh, and that was, <clears throat> I was reminded of that constantly on a daily basis, you know, your, your abru. Actually, I, I have a few sentences that would explain it because it's foreign, I think, to Americans, the whole idea of abru. Uh, in the memoir, I wrote, uh, let's see if I can find this. There isn't, <clears throat> there isn't an equivalent Anglo-Saxon word that accurately conveys Aubrey's weight and power, a tenet of daily Persian life. Ab means water and ru is face, translates into purifying water streaming over one's face. To Persians, it means honor, standing, reputation, status, all rolled into one. Accumulating and maintaining abru is centrally important. If your great grandfather, grandfather, father lived honest and ethical lives, lives of integrity, wisdom, and proper social conduct, then when you're born, you inherit their honor. Abru is respected. Abru, a respected face, becomes your social currency, your wealth, even a credit line, unless lost through missteps. In Iran, ill conduct didn't just damage one's own social status, it had lasting multi-generational effects, tainting the reputation and prospects of future descendants. So that's pretty heavy. And um, I, I think that I grew up with bifocals. I was seeing the world through American eyes. I was born and raised here and went to public school. And the other lens was the Mashadi lens. Um, and so it was a situation where I was always confused. And I was a very quiet child, an observant one, a deferential one. I didn't make a lot of ruckus, but internally I was, there was dissonance and um, it was very confusing for me as to who I am, who I'm supposed to be um, and how to satisfy everyone. My parents at home and the American school system, my social life outside of the home. That explains a lot about your current profession as a psychoanalyst. Absolutely. There's a strong. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Roya, can you talk about where you brought up with this concept of being Najib and Abiru and. Yeah. Everything well, um, I grew up exactly with what, uh, what Esther described until the age of 12 and then life changed. Right. So, you know, it's. Um, uh, nobody was the same after 1979, and, and suddenly there was a major eruption, and, and everybody had been um, moved off kilter, you know, all equilibrium throughout the country, uh, Jewish community included, had been, you know, had been shifted. And therefore, you know, even, and then, you know, into that, of course, enters uh, my own very rebellious spirit at the you know, exactly at the cusp of adolescence. And therefore, um, I rebelled against all those things. And fortunately, um, because, you know, everything had been so destabilized as a result of, you know, the community 
taking flight from Iran and then everything uh, being in the state that it was, um, I got away with so much. Um, in, in some ways, I remember um, uh, one of the mothers of a friend of mine came to our house one day to say, you know, your daughter, say to my dad, um, your daughter keeps taking my daughter out and they go to mountain climbing and this and that and I don't like it. And I remember my father said, I don't like it either, but I can't stop her. So what I can recommend is you stop your daughter from socializing with mine. And that's the best thing I can recommend. And that, and that was true. Um, and, and the best part was that um, I think it, I, I can definitely see myself uh, growing up precisely as Esther did. But I think what really in some ways, in a, in a very ironic way, uh, rescued me was being there in the midst of this revolution, which created all these unpredictable and, uh, you know, uh, discontented uh, state of affairs where, uh, therefore, I, along with uh, a, a group of Iranian Jews, um, were doing our own thing and, uh, you know, being rebellious and proud of it. And, and so, uh, by the time I had arrived in America several years later, I had I had grown very much accustomed to to the liberties that I had uh, created for myself. So um, and and I I felt very lucky um, that my family didn't decide to be in California because I was watching you know relatives and their kids who were in California being able to do a lot less than I was uh, in New York, where we didn't have as, as large a Jewish community uh, in the areas where my parents and I and my siblings were living in Brooklyn. And therefore that, you know, my freedom kind of went on, fortunately. Right, so you, you were afforded more freedom because there was less of a chance of gossip, people watching, commenting yeah, and then you know it, it it's also i have to say <laughs> that uh, it was also who i was at the same time and so right. i remember several times my mother coming to me and say and saying you know i you know you are compromising our aburu our re reputation is being ruined and i remember at one point i said something incredibly cruel which was everybody's Abru, everybody's reputation will be ruined one day or another, and this is how yours will be ruined. And I, and I remember feeling, you know, at, even at that moment when I was 19, thinking to myself, I am going to regret this because this is my mom, but I said it. And, and, um, and you know, this was really in some ways who I was, not, not simply a product of the circumstances, but also, you know, uh, my own, so, uh, character and personality too. Right. You know that we we're very lucky that there are a lot of great Iranian Jewish female writers, memoirists, um, fiction, nonfiction, etc. And Roy, why don't we start with you? What? Why write a memoir? Um, one, how, what was the reception of your family and loved ones? Because again, you're growing up in a culture where we're taught everything is private and in the family. So what was the, why write a memoir? Um, how did Why that... not write a memoir? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, look, when, when I wrote mine, um, which was in 2004, there weren't very many. Um, in fact, I, it, I, published my memoir within the same year as uh, the, the uh, Azar Nafisi's uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran. And, and that was um, one of a handful of memoirs um, that had already been released. And, and, I, and at the time, it, it, was, uh, it was not so much an account that um, had been uh, discussed. I mean, there was, you know, this is almost 20 years ago, there was still a great deal of curiosity and wonder about what had truly happened in Iran at the time of the revolution. And, and the reason I felt very compelled, as I discussed in the first chapter of the memoir, was because I thought 
people were misunderstanding the revolution. People were misunderstanding Iran. People were misunderstanding uh, the Jewish community in Iran. And, and I wrote the memoir um, primarily because I wanted to set three things straight. One was, you know, what had happened, what, what the revolution was, as far as I had seen it. The second thing was um, who, you know, who were the women, what happened to women before and after the revolution. And the third was, because this was very shocking to me, everywhere I went, even within the American Jewish community, I would say I'm from Iran, and uh, all, more often than not, I would hear there are Jews in Iran. And, and that really, it, it shook me up. And I thought, I'm going to set that record straight too and talk about what I knew of the Iranian Jewish community. So, so there, I had three uh, major reasons why I thought you know, the, the common perceptions needed to be corrected. And what was the response of your family to you writing a memoir? It's, it's really, uh, it's fascinating because uh, in some ways, I'm glad um, my mom and dad, um, although they knew English by then, um, were not uh, in readers of English books. So I think uh, I may have, uh, I could have hurt their feelings if they were able to actually read the book. Um, although I think, um, or you know, they may have disagreed, that um, I had treated them with a great deal of, um, you know, respect and kindness as I felt towards them and continue to. But, um, but I think I also reveal a great deal uh, about how I saw uh, not just my own immediate fam family, but the extended family and place it within exactly what Esther describes as the, the constant restrictions that the Jewish community uh, mirrored of the broader Muslim community. And that, that was incredibly suffocating as Esther so eloquently puts it. And so I think if, if my parents had, had been able to read the book, they would have taken those aspects really personally um, and may have you know, felt offended, but, but in some ways it was lucky and the only thing that they heard was that other people who had read the book would give them a call, or in some case, somebody had sent a bouquet of flowers to my dad. And so he just felt very proud um, right. when, when he got that sort of feedback. Right, thank you. And Esther, why write a memoir? I think for decades I was haunted by the question, what does memory want from me? You know, what do I owe memory? Um, and so it took me a long time to decide to do this. Uh, so I wrote Concealed to break the silence. I, you know, I come from a legacy, a heritage of underground Jews who certainly did not write memoirs. <clears throat> they were pretending to be other than who they were. That would have been too dangerous a thing to do. I come from a legacy of women who could not read and write. Uh, and so I felt a real obligation to defy Mashad, which silenced them, to give voice to my parents, my ancestors, to make sure I resurrect their history, I rescue them from obscurity, and to thread the Mashadi story into the larger Jewish tapestry. I felt that was also very important to do and to make sense out of confusion on a very personal level, on a very private level, writing develops fluency with oneself. And so the more I was writing, the more I was knowing me. And that was very important to kind of integrate my disparate parts, which I, I did experience happening. Um, so it, there were multiple reasons for doing it. And I know you're going to ask me, Saba, so how did my parents, how did my family respond? Because the book is very honest and transparent. Um, <clears throat> well, I didn't begin writing this book uh, until recently. And, and my mother passed away, let's see, we're now the year 21. Uh, my mother passed away 
21 years ago, and my father passed away 25 years ago. And it took that kind of distance for me to be able to think. It was more about integrating their story, my story, and being able to stand on this mountain and look back and have a clearer perspective as to what it was all about, you know, understanding them being more, I think, attuned to who they really were. Uh, the book is written through many lenses. You, you get that young child, me, the young child speaking, and then later on pre-adolescence and then the teenager, and you have the young adult. And of course, the way I'm trying to understand this world and this clash of symbols, my parents were diametric opposites, Iran and America felt like diametric opposites. And my attempt to understand all of this was an evolution. I kept changing my interpretation. Um, and so to have that distance was very important for me uh, and to be ready for it, to have room in my mind and in my life, because it took me five years to write Concealed and uh, writing it, rewriting it, memories surfacing, uh, memories that I had conveniently buried for decades so started to appear and um, it was because I was writing. Uh, so it was quite a process and uh, I'm grateful I went through it. You know, you talk about the theme of memory. Um, I feel like memory and in a sense trauma and I think all I, uh, immigrants who escape something deal with trauma. Is trauma a theme or in, in writing something that has helped with trauma and intergenerational trauma for our, both of you? Who, who would you like to speak? I'm sure if, if you would like to talk. Um, I mean, trauma is definitely in, in my memoir, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't narrow it down and say that's the theme. I wouldn't say uh, it's all about what my parents went through and then somehow it got transferred down to me and then what I went through. I really wouldn't say that. Uh, there are so many themes that run through it. I think for me, it was more about the dissonance. Mm -hmm. It was more about finding out who I am and being able to integrate uh, opposing worlds. Uh, it was more about feeling like an outsider uh, for most of my life and beginning to value that position of being the outsider. I think, as you know, Roya, when you feel like an outsider, um, it helps as a writer, it helps as a painter, it helps in the whole creative process where you don't feel you're so much in the mix, but you're watching it from abroad um, and so I then valued later in life um, feeling different uh, and, and how all that happened. Uh, I think finding oneself is, is really what the book is about and, um, and reinterpreting life from stage to stage for me. Was there a trickling down of trauma? Absolutely. I mean, my parents concealed themselves. My ancestors pretended they were someone else. And then here I'm growing up in the United States and I was hiding who I was. Uh, I was hiding my aspirations, my dreams, because they were antithetical to what my father wanted for me. Um, and he wanted me to remain illiterate. That was one of his primary goals. Uh, he banned books. I had to read in secret under the sheets with a flashlight in bed. Uh, so here I was concealing who I was in my way, even though I'm growing up in Queens, New York, uh, and attending public school, uh, hiding my report cards because I was getting straight A's and he would have a meltdown uh, because he didn't want me to go to school. I mean, it was basic, as simple as that. Um, so the concealment continued, but it served me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it developed my muscles. Uh, I learned how to jump over hurdles. 
Um, I did get myself into college and that's, there's a wild, crazy story about that because my father went on a suicidal hunger strike when he learned um, I was gonna move into Barnard, into the dorms. And he was serious, he stopped eating uh, for 10 days. And so how I got through all of that, you know, I wanted to keep them and I wanted to keep me. I didn't want really to give up anyone and, right. and how to do that. And so I think having obstacles can really serve us, you know, if, if we perceive it that way. Uh, ways in which we can develop our own strengths and, and navigate um, and come out feeling more whole. Mm -hmm. And it's all possible. Uh, so for me, it wasn't so much about the trickling of trauma, but how, how, uh, how the obstacles um, led to who I finally became. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to talk afterwards about the navigation that I think we all do when you know our, we're children of immigrants or we are immigrants. Uh, Roya, what did writing a memoir? How did how did that help you process your life, or you know, mm -hmm. if there was trauma, the the experience of coming to America, etc. Mm -hmm. um, well, my memoir ends uh, at in okay. Iran. So it doesn't uh, bring the story up to, uh, you know, uh, our exodus, so to speak. And, and it's very interesting because I, mm, I teach a creative uh, writing course from time to time. And I often uh, drive my students crazy when I say that a memoir isn't necessarily about you. It's, it's about you turning yourself into a conduit of something larger than yourself. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with memoirs that are about a single individual, if that single individual, um, in, in our case, Esther, has, uh, has something really important to reveal. But I think m most, the rest of us um, may uh, find the value in becoming personal in in what it is that we observe and live through and how it is that we become vehicles of a story larger than our own. And, and in my case, that story was the story of Iran. Um, and, and that is why exactly I really limit the book in, in or, or tell the entire story of only 10 years. I don't go prior, I don't tell about whatever it was that was happening prior to 1974, and I don't go past 1984. I was very dedicated to zeroing in on the 10 years during which Iran, in my eyes, transformed from what it was uh, into what it became. And, and in fact, the trauma, I think, in, in my view, was the trauma of um, a nation, a community, a history, um, and, and my job was to be a narrator of that, of that trauma that I was observing. It, I have said time and again that, that I could write about those precise years um, it, many more times and tell, and tell those, you know, about the stories of those years in, in entirely new and different ways. I, it could be uh, very, very personal, very different from, from this current book. So there was enough material, but, but my focus was, um, was on the history and, and how I had um, watched that history unfold. Right. Okay, thank you. And we had a question from the audience, and I actually want to address it to both of you. The question was specifically to Esther in regards to what are some of the traditions that you have, um, sorry, can you describe some of the secret Jewish observances that your family held? And then for both of you, uh, what are some of the aspects now that you are Iranian Jewish women living outside of Iran, aspects of the Iranian Jewish culture or community that you have retained for yourselves and your own family? Did you say, Saba, you wanted me to go? Sure. So Esther, uh, 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 
someone asked about what were some of the crypto Jewish uh, traditions, observances that your family held? I, in, I can only speak for my family. So in my family, there weren't any crypto Jewish traditions. Um, my parents were devout Jews uh, and they observed Kashrut, Shabbat, the holidays um, traditionally. Uh, so there wasn't a crypto aspect to the way they practiced Judaism. Um, I think being in the United States and being able to go to a synagogue and be above the ground was an incredibly novel experience for them. And I wrote about that. It was very, very emotional um, to, to be able to be visible, public, uh, and not be afraid of being killed, uh, losing your life. Um, so that's, that's how I would answer it. I, I can't speak for other Mashadi families, but in my family, uh, there were no traditions that were that came from the crypto life. Wonderful. And um, Esther, what aspects of the Persian Jewish or Iranian Jewish community have you retained in your own life and in your own family? Well, Persian food is delicious. And uh, as you know, Roya, it's wonderful. And so my mother was a phenomenal cook. <clears throat> and I, I rebelled for many years. I did not want to spend time in the kitchen. And then later on, I took some of her recipes. And I, I do make Persian dishes. So that's something that has continued. And our adult children love the food. And uh, so the food, for sure. Uh, I think there's a very strong feeling of family and community and being tightly knit, although I do not live in the Mashadi community. Uh, I live in Manhattan and the Mashadi community is in Great Neck. Um, so it's not on a literal level. It's not as if I am part of that community. I, I married an Ashkenazi um, and we raised our children Ashkenazi style. Uh, but I think that whole value system of really valuing family and extended family and community is something that's not specific to Persian Jewry. I mean, I think it's also European, South American. You find this, the Italians are this way. You find this in many cultures, but it's something that has definitely permeated my life and something I've passed on. Yeah, Roya. I agree with Esther, um, and and you know now I remember only lately in in the past several years when I go to synagogue, um, I try very hard to remember because I I belong to a Ashkenazi synagogue. Uh, I try very hard to remember the tunes that I had uh, grown up with in in the Iranian synagogue in Tehran that that we were part of. And uh, so I think, you know, in some ways I remember, uh, and perhaps I'm misremembering, but I remember that everybody was um, trying to zip through the prayers. And, you know, they, they, I remember it was, you know, everybody was just really, whoever the chazan was, it was, it was as if he was being chased by, by, by rabid dogs because he, uh, you know, recited everything that quickly. But, but I do remember um, that there were aspects to um, to the way uh, uh, the prayers were performed, to the way uh, the scripture was read. Um, I also remember that you know at the threshold of the synagogue, um, somebody who um, you know had uh, was was marking the uh, anniversary of the passing of of a loved one um, would bring uh, rose water or um, something to eat, you know, whether it was um, a, a quiche or something, and 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 they would stand at the threshold and either you know pour the rose water so that you would be then uh, say a blessing um, uh, as you entered, or take a piece of something to eat and, or and say a blessing um, in honor of their you know loved one 
who had passed. But I remember all those things very fondly. And, um, and those are the things that, in fact, you know, or the tunes that I remember are some of the things that I'm trying to, in fact, introduce to um, members of our own synagogue to kind of, you know, uh, create a more a melange of, of practices if we can. Um, but as Esther said, you know, it was um, it, it, so much of it is about warmth, is about um, putting, you know, the, the collective above uh, the singular. And, and those are not uniquely Iranian Jewish values, but, but certainly um, I think Iranian Jews live by them um, uh, so far as we, we were in Iran. Arya, we are about 43 years post-revolution. Yeah. What would you hope, what, do you, what would you like to see for Iranian Jewish women? especially the ones who are growing up in, in America, who mm -hmm. were not born in Iran, don't know Iran. It's really just through their parents, grandparents, histories and stories. There are, there are two things. One is that, um, and, and I don't want it just for Iranian Jewish women, I want it for all Iranian Jews, is to um, remember the past justly, you know, um, because I think uh, we, we as human beings tend to um, be uh, either overtly unkind or, um, or you know, misremember things, um, you know, once we have uprooted ourselves, um, depending on where we land and, and how life moves forward from that point forward. And, and I would like for us um, to to be fair to the past. Because I think what's important to remember is, is um, at the end of the day, what happened to Iran as a country, that um, it, it wasn't something, it, we as Jews were not so much targeted as, as it was a community and, and a country that um, fell to, uh, you know, to, a, a, to victim in some ways to uh, tragic events. Um, and I think it's, it's because I, I do give readings where um, uh, within, within the American Jewish community where people often say to me, this is exactly what happened in Germany. And I have to say, no, 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 no. This isn't what happened in Germany. Um, you know, it, 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 so you have to distinguish because it's so, it's so easy um, for all of us in some ways, inadvertently and, and in an effort to, in some ways, embrace each other, to uh, try to, um, you know, um, overlay our narratives over one, one another's narratives. And, and I think um, if our narratives uh, are of any value, it is in their own distinct truths and, and facts that they can uh, be of value and serve us. So that's that's one thing. But as far as the women are concerned, um, I would like us um, women to um, to be able to find our own voices, to um, to you know do away with what has been uh, taught to us and our predecessors as virtues. You know whether it's abru or Najib, whether it's, you know, to be virtuous by, you know, by being silent, by being submissive, by being, you know, um, good wives and good daughters only. Um, there's nothing wrong with being good wives and good daughters, but, but um, you, one needs to be uh, true to oneself and pursue one's ambitions and, and fulfill one's potentials too. Um, and that's what I hope for um, my, my fellow Iranian Jewish women. Would you like to answer that question? You're asking me, Saba? Yes, yes. Esther, would you like to answer that question? Uh, yeah, I was, I was listening closely to Roya. I, I certainly agree with everything she's saying. Uh, I think it depends on who we're talking to. Like if when you say Iranian, if you're saying American born Iranian girls, 
So if I was asking you to come into to be a guest lecturer in my course on Iranian Jewish um, history, where I have college students and we're looking at specifically post 79, what would you say to an audience full of UCLA students, mostly who are Iranian Jewish, who are mostly women? No, I, I hear you. I, I think, again, I, it depends on who I'm talking to. You know, uh, I hear what you're describing, that group. But they're each <clears throat> they're each different, and so I think there are girls who are still stuck and feeling somehow suffocated by Iran, and it has passed down to them. Whether we're talking about being Najib, being uh, uh, being aware of Abru, and it has a suffocating effect, then of course you know everything Roy is saying is absolutely correct. You want them to feel liberated and to be uh, and to be able to flex their muscles and become whoever they need to become. That's for sure. But what about those who have who feel very American and who have disengaged from the past and have turned their backs and feel that has nothing to do with them anymore? I mean, that's a different population within this population. And what I would recommend that they acquaint themselves with the richness of the Persian culture, you know, the language, the music, the art, the architecture, uh, the, the philosophy, the poets. Uh, there is so much that Iran and prior to Iran, Persia contributed to the world and I would want them to discover it and feel that that too is a part of them. Thank you. And um, Esther, we, a lot of people are very interested and I, we only have two minutes, um, but with your family's life, our Mashadi Jews as crypto Jews, how did they keep kosher? One of the audience members wanted to know. No, that's a good question. Uh, I did question my parents and they said that they didn't eat beef. Uh, they ate uh, a lot of chicken, and my, my father was able to kish, kill kosher style. He was a shohet, uh, and share the chicken with other families. Um, they also would eat lamb, which was something they knew how to, they knew how to kosher, how to kill kosher style, slaughter uh, according to Jewish law. Uh, but there was a lot of dairy. They ate a lot of dairy. Um, and they managed. It was really chicken, fish, dairy, and occasionally lamb. Wonderful. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank both of you. Um, this has been so wonderful. It's been so great to have this opportunity to, you know, really pick both of your brains and expound on your stories and your narratives. And um, thank you for being here with us. Thank you to the audience for being here and listening. I'm going to take it back to Sydney. Yeah, I would really like to echo what Saba just said. And also thank you, Saba. Um, you all, this was amazing. I learned so much. Um, it's really been a pleasure to uh, be a part of this uh, program. Um, and to the audience, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, everything we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. Um, to those of you watching, we do hope that you'll consider making a donation to support the museum or becoming a member and joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can check out at the link in the Zoom chat. Um, have a great afternoon and thank you so much again for joining us. <laughs>